I wanted to see if I could find the value of absolute zero for myself experimentally. I'm sure you know what absolute zero is, but just to recap, you can take something and you can heat it up as much as you like. You can keep going, getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter indefinitely. That's not true in the opposite direction. If you keep cooling something down, eventually you'll reach a limit. You can't go any colder than that. That's because temperature is a function of thermal energy. And thermal energy is just like how much are the atoms and molecules inside something jiggling around. So the more the atoms and molecules are jiggling around, the hotter the thing is. And the less they're jiggling around, the colder the thing is. And so if you keep cooling something down, you eventually get to the point where those atoms and molecules aren't jiggling anymore. The point I'm trying to make is there's no such thing as negative jiggle. It's called absolute zero because of the Kelvin scale. And by definition on the Kelvin scale, zero is the coldest possible thing. So in some sense, I don't need to find the value of absolute zero because it's zero on the Kelvin scale. The question really is, what's the value of absolute zero on the centigrade scale or the Fahrenheit scale? Not the Fahrenheit scale, that's stupid, but on the centigrade scale, what's the value of absolute zero? Or to switch it around, you could say, what is the value of the freezing point of water at atmospheric pressure on the Kelvin scale? In other words, we're trying to link these two scales to find out what absolute zero really means in terms of what we already understand. A degree on the Kelvin scale and a degree on the Celsius scale are the same size. It's just the zeros on those two scales are in different places. By the way, apologies if I keep switching between Celsius and centigrade. They mean the same thing. Centigrade is just an older word that people don't use anymore, but I keep using it because I'm an asshole. Interesting word origin, by the way, centigrade. So centi means 100 and there are 100 gradations between the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water, which is right. The freezing point is zero and the boiling point is 100. So how are we going to find absolute zero experimentally? You may have heard of this equation, PV equals NRT. It's the ideal gas law where P is pressure, V is volume, N is how much gas there is, R is a constant and T is temperature. Let's decide in our experiment that the amount of gas is going to stay the same. We're not going to let any in or let any out. So N is constant as well. And let's design our experiment so the pressure stays the same. So P is constant. Let's rearrange this equation by dividing both sides by P. We've now got V equals NRT divided by P. And because N, R and P are all constant by design of our experiment, we can say that V equals some constant multiplied by T. In other words, V and T are proportional to each other. If you double one of them, you double the other. If you halve one of them, you halve the other. And by the way, in this simplified form, this is Charles's law. These equations work when you plug in values of temperature from the Kelvin scale. They don't work if you plug in temperatures from the Celsius scale or the Fahrenheit scale. That's because these equations rely on temperatures from an absolute scale of temperature, of which the Kelvin scale is an example. An absolute scale is one where the zero value on that scale means something. It means none of something. It's an actual zero in some sense. So in the Kelvin scale, it means zero thermal energy or zero jiggle. Whereas the zero on the Celsius scale, it doesn't mean zero of anything. You can proceed in either direction from zero. Another example of a relative scale is our date system. So the zeroth year on our date system was first defined by Dionysus Exegus, who believed it was the date of Jesus' birth, and you can proceed in either direction from that zero. If we wanted an absolute date scale, then I guess we should go all the way back to the birth of the universe. Two problems with that. First, we don't know how far back the birth of the universe was to that kind of accuracy. And even if we did, it would make writing out the year in full incredibly tedious. So how can we use this equation to find the value of absolute zero? Well, let's assume we've got a volume of gas and it's at room temperature, 21 degrees centigrade. Look, there it is. But you know from what I just said moments ago that we've made a mistake. We can't plug Celsius into this equation. It needs to be Kelvin. So we need to convert 21 degrees Celsius into the Kelvin equivalent. 
How do we do that? Well, 21 degrees Celsius means 21 degrees above the freezing point of water. So to convert to Kelvin, we just need to know the temperature of the freezing point of water in Kelvin and then add 21 to that. So we could look up the temperature of the freezing point of water in Kelvin, but that would defeat the purpose. That's the thing we're trying to work out, right? That's the thing that we're pretending we don't already know, that we want to find experimentally for ourselves. So let's call that value x and put that into the equation. So there we go. That value in brackets, that's room temperature in Kelvin. And we've got that unknown value in there. So all we have to do is take some measurements, look, there's the volume, there's the temperature, and then rearrange the equation to solve for x. So let's do that. Divide both sides by a, subtract 21 from both sides, and there's x. There's our value of the freezing point of water in Kelvin. So what would happen if we did the experiments and plugged some values in? Well, remember our constant a here is actually hiding a load of stuff. A is actually nr divided by p. So we need to plug those values in as well as the things we measured experimentally. So n is the amount of gas. We can measure that. It's in moles. Um, the pressure is atmospheric pressure. We can measure that and plug that in. R is the ideal gas constant, and we could plug that in as well. We just look it up, except that's cheating because the ideal gas constant and absolute zero are linked. Like, if you know one, you get the other for free. So if we're pretending not to know what absolute zero is, then we need to pretend not to know what the ideal gas constant R is as well. In fact, we could reframe this whole video and say it's about finding R experimentally for ourselves, but let's stick with finding absolute zero and just know that we could derive R from that if we wanted to. So how do we proceed? Well, we need to do the experiment twice at two different temperatures, and then we'll end up with two different equations that we can combine in such a way as to cancel out those unknown constants and then we can solve for x. Here's the derivation on screen for how you get x from two sets of measurements. Pause the video if you're interested in the details. By the way, you can see from the final equation that it doesn't matter what units we use for volume because they're always in ratio with each other. So we're going to use milliliters for convenience. What about the experiment itself? How do we design this thing so we can have a volume of gas, change the temperature, see how the volume changes, record it all. My first thinking was to use a syringe. So, you know, seal off the end. You know how much gas is in there because it's written on the side of the syringe. You change the temperature, see how the volume changes. The issue is that the piston of a syringe has quite a bit of friction. So look, it's on 60 at the moment. If I push it up and then let go, it doesn't relax all the way back to 60. It stays slightly higher than that, meaning the pressure inside here is higher than atmospheric pressure. We've failed to keep pressure constant, which if you remember, that's one of the things we need to do. So here's my solution. You take a volume of gas with uh, you know, measurements up the side like this, and you seal it off except for a tube filled with some liquid like water, for example, so that when the volume of gas goes down because we've lowered the temperature, let's say, it's going to pull liquid in through the tube. So, you know, the other end of the tube will be in a reservoir of the liquid, which is free to the elements ensuring that we've got atmospheric pressure everywhere, even inside here. So instead of having this um, piston uh, seal, we've got this friction-free liquid seal. Ideally, we want to take measurements at two extremes of temperature to reduce the impact of measurement errors. So I had the idea of putting the whole assembly in a freezer to get it really cold, but then if the liquid inside is water, the water's gonna freeze. So I had the idea, let's use vodka as the liquid instead of water. Here, I'm sucking air out through a hole and that will pull vodka into the tube and into the container. I need some vodka in the container to begin with because the gas will expand when I heat it. And so I need room for that. 
and then I seal off that hole. So we've got an airtight container. I originally had the temperature probe embedded in the volume of gas as well. The problem with putting the whole assembly in the freezer is that the electronics inside just shut off below a certain temperature. So I've ditched that idea. Instead of the freezer, we're gonna put the whole thing in an ice salt bath, which gets us below freezing. And instead of having the thermal probe inside the chamber, we'll have it in the bath water, so to speak. All we have to do is give the whole setup time to equilibrate, so the temperature inside the chamber is the same as the temperature inside the ice salt bath. So here we go. So we've got a temperature of minus 0.2. We've got a volume of vodka. It's hard to see, but it's just shy of 105 milliliters. Subtract that from the total volume of the container and compensate for the volume of the rubber tube. You get a volume of gas of 135 milliliters. In the hot bath, the temperature is 51.1. The volume of vodka is 60 milliliters, which translates to a gas volume of 180 milliliters. So if we plug all those values into the equation, we get that the freezing point of water on the Kelvin scale is 154 degrees, or in other words, absolute zero on the centigrade scale is minus 154 degrees. So, at this point, we might as well just Google it and find out what it really is. Oops. Oh, for f it's not great, is it? I think there's potentially a number of issues with my experimental setup, but one obvious one is that maybe we're changing the amount of gas in the chamber. That seems like it couldn't be possible because the chamber is sealed, but alcohol is quite volatile, so it's gonna evaporate. There's gonna be alcohol vapor in that chamber. And when the chamber cools down, some of that alcohol vapor is gonna turn back into liquid alcohol. It's going to be removed from the gas. The amount of gas in the chamber will go down. And that's consistent with the way we're getting the number wrong. The number we get is too small because the volume's going down too much. So I decided to revisit the syringe option, but lubricating the syringe to remove the issue of friction. And with a little bit of olive oil, it seems to have improved the situation drastically. So we're gonna do the experiment twice. We're gonna do it with a salt ice bath and we're gonna do it with hot water from the kettle. And these are the values we've got, minus 1.2 degrees, 54 milliliters, 75.6 degrees, and 68 milliliters. When we plug all those values into the equation, we get that absolute zero on the Celsius scale is minus 297 degrees Celsius. And that is not terrible. There are a number of ways you can improve this experiment like obviously improving the equipment. There is still friction in the syringe. You could figure out a way to avoid that. You could take several data points and then you end up with a line of best fit on a graph and that's gonna be more accurate too. But that's the general principle at least and it seems to be working quite well. And actually, by definition, absolute zero is this extrapolated value. You don't find absolute zero by getting colder and colder and colder and colder, like, you know, going on a quest for it in that direction. It's extrapolated by definition because actually the ideal gas laws start to break down eventually. You know, gases turn into liquids, liquids turn into solids. Like if you decrease the temperature to zero, according to the ideal gas law, the volume should be zero. But of course, at some point, you've got all these atoms packed together. It can't go any smaller than that. And then from a quantum mechanical point of view, you're talking about like the, the ground state energy and, and things like that. So yeah, what we've done here really is the definition of absolute zero. We've just done it quite badly. Thanks to Jim Loy for sending me the idea for this video. I do appreciate you lot sending me ideas from time to time, keep them coming. You know, I think the lesson for this video is that if you're trying to work out something for yourself, it's really helpful if someone else has already done a much better job. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. I've explained in previous videos what a VPN is, but you know, I feel like my explanations get better over time, so let's have another go. So a VPN takes all the beep boops coming from your thingamajig, um, whether it's this sort of thingamajig or this sort of thingamajig, 
and it turns them into a scrumbly wumbly mess. And those scrumbly wumblies are sent down a metaphorical tube. But the clever part is the specific mechanism for scrumbly wumbling the beep boops can be reversed so long as you know the super secret thing. So the super secret thing is used to unscrumble wumble the beep boops at the other end of the metaphorical tube and then those beep boops are passed on to where they were going to go in the first place. Why would you want to do that to your beep boops in the first place? Well, if the beep boops you're sending out from your thingamajig are encoding for sensitive information like your name and address or heaven forbid your passwords and you're not already scrumbly wumbling those beep boops with with an SSL, then you might want to consider using a VPN like NordVPN to do the scrumbly wumbling for you. Another use case is uh, I used to work at a company that had uh, free Wi-Fi that you could use so I could send and receive beep boops from my personal thingamajig while at work, which was great, except they blocked certain types of beep certain types of boop, for example, video beep boops and social media beep boops. So I was able to get around that by scrumbly wumbling the beep boops with a VPN like NordVPN. Maybe I've oversimplified it. But you look, you know, here's the thing that I always say, like do the research for yourself. There's a lot to learn about VPNs, what they can do, what they can't do. And at the end of it, you might figure out that actually this is something that I want or this is something that I need. If you get to that point, consider using my promo code. If you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Steve, that'll get you 70% off a three year plan. And if you use the promo code Steve at checkout, you'll get one additional month absolutely free. So check out NordVPN today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe and I'll see you next time.